everybody. It's time for another episode of Wandering Spirits of the Pacific Northwest, and I am Martina. And as always, with me is my co-host and partner in crime, James, and my dog barking in the background. I don't know if you can hear her, but that is her. And tonight we have a really special episode of Wandering Spirits, just because we're talking about something a little bit different, or we're mixing in a little bit of different stuff today in honor of Pride Month, yep. which brings me to a really important question, which is, have you ever wondered why you don't hear LGBTQ ghost stories? Mm. It's weird, right? Yeah. According to the Human Rights Campaign, there are at least 20 million people in the U.S. alone who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or... Um, and so Pride Month has us thinking about with all those people who do not identify as straight, why do you never hear ghost stories mentioning people who are, you know, not straight? Right. So we decided to do a little bit of research to find them. And what we found was pretty much crickets, a big fat old bunch of nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I tried researching in different places. I I work with AI as part of the way that I earn my living. And mm -hmm. so I'm pretty good at dealing with it. I even did some AI research and found that basically it made a whole bunch of crap up <laughs> and was trying to make pretty much everyone in the paranormal community gay or lesbian <laughs> or, or at least bi. <laughs> That's which <laughs> totally unrelated to anything paranormal, just yeah. as someone who does work as a writer and who does work testing AI, don't believe everything mm -hmm. chat GPT or other AI based things tell you because yeah. it's not always true. You always mm -hmm. need to read, <laughs> like, right? With, like with anything you hear, you always yeah. need to consider the source and yep. do your research. <laughs> While I say I didn't find much, or I didn't find much that I felt was super credible. Mm -hmm. um, what I did find were a couple of website mentions. I found one video on YouTube that I thought was going to be so promising because it was about Oscar Wilde and this hotel he stayed in when he was touring, doing poetry readings at some woman's mm -hmm. college in Canada. And again, uh -huh. I sat through the whole video, whole big fat, Load enough. <laughs> because really, why would he be haunting an in state out right. for three days right. um, on a book tour? But, you know, yep. I guess it could have happened. Yeah. Now, what I did find was Ken Summers, if you're a fan of the LGBTQ ghost hunting show, Living for the Dead. Oh, Living for the Dead. Okay. Uh -huh. fan of Living for the Dead, you'll know that he is, and that show is awesome if you have mm -hmm. not seen it. Yep. Um, you'll know that he is a cast member, but what you might not know is that he actually wrote a book called Queer Hauntings, True Tales of Gay and Lesbian Ghosts. And I have to say that a lot of this episode is inspired by it, but we also did some extra research and found some mm -hmm. things because we're diligent that way. And we just kind of felt called as a woman owned and gay male owned business mm -hmm. <laughs> to do something that would pay homage to our spectral brothers and sisters of the LGBTQ variety. <laughs> so, there you go. Wonderful. Get started. so very fun episode. I'm kind of excited to do this. Now, Ken Summers, is he the one that wears the black hat? Usually the beard. Is yeah. that him? Okay. Okay. I wasn't sure, sure who he was. And then, yeah, I think, I think that's right. Yeah, I, I'm I'm like ninety eight percent. Yeah, sure. yeah, me too. Great show though. I I really hope it is. I love the whole cast. It's mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, they're really good. So the first place I want to talk about um, isn't unknown to the paranormal community. It's a, the actual the Hollywood Roosevelt um, Hotel in California. And that hotel is primarily known for the ghostly image of Marilyn Monroe that actually appears in one of its mirrors. 
that the iconic hotel is actually a final resting place for the spirit of a gay actor by the name of Montgomery Clift. Now, the stunningly handsome, if I may say so myself. Yes, he was a heartthrob in his he was day. Very handsome, yes. And I do want to say that while this is a family show, Martina insisted I put that shirtless picture of him up there. I had nothing. You're welcome. <laughs> so Montgomery Clifton has a really a kind of a sad story. Um, he died on July 23rd, 1966 of a major heart attack caused, caused by coronary artery disease. And he was only 45 years old. He's That's a year so older than I am now. Yeah. So it's like, oof. And he was in a lot better shape than I am now, too. But, you know, uh, but that wasn't his first kind of, you know, brush of death or death experience. He actually had a very um, traumatic and horrible accident back in on the evening of May 12th in 1956. He was shooting a movie um, and Montgomery or Monty uh, was involved in a very serious car accident on his way back from a party at the house of Elizabeth Taylor. So he apparently fell asleep at the wheel of his car while driving. He smashed his car into a telephone pole. Um, he had injuries were extensive and included, uh, he had a major concussion, broken jaw, broken nose, fractured sinuses, fractured cheekbones, and several facial, facial lacerations. And he actually required several plastic surgeries. And wow. plastics yeah, and plastic surgery in 1956 is not what it is today. And it actually um, affected his looks. He became very depressed. He became an uh, alcoholic, used a lot of drugs. Um, and so that really had contributed, unfortunately, to his early, um, early death. So in, according to the book Hollywood Haunted, Monty is still, he liked to practice the bugle uh, in room 928, where he stayed for several months in 1952 during the filming of From Here to Eternity. And ghost centers and researchers alike, um, they still check into that room on occasion. They stay there um, to see if they can hear him practicing his, his bugle still. So... Um, there's an image of the Roosevelt Hotel there, again, very famous for, for Monty, and it's actually several entities are said to to be at the hotel there. Wow, I did not know that. That must yeah. be so difficult to go from being so, mm -hmm. like, ridiculously good-looking yeah. yeah. and to, to having to grapple with, I mean, just any, right, any kind of accident that really changes your appearance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a really difficult piece to it in just sort of adjusting to how you look now yeah, and yeah. all of that. But for someone who whose whole living and way yeah. of life would have been based so heavily mm -hmm. on his parents, that must yeah. have added just like. Yeah, and you can trauma. see um, before surgery and after surgery mm -hmm. pictures. I there there's you know some scarring on the side mm -hmm. but that's really it i mean he's still a very handsome man but you know just that was enough to kind of push him into depression and it's sad so martina take us across the pond yeah so we're gonna talk about alistair crowley who in his day was um and of course even today is a really famous occultist and was known as the wickedest man in the world. Wow. And Alistair Crowley lived in Scotland at one point in a house that's called Bolskin House, which overlooks Loch Ness. Mm -hmm. And he was a flamboyant and controversial figure in his day, just as as he is today. He was mm -hmm. renowned for an orthodox, probably puts it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> practices and a really bold exploration of occultism and mm. many people believe that both skin house is is haunted today and while um many people remember him for his just uber dramatic 
persona and his occult writings. Hmm. He also was known <laughs> for oh my tastefully named daring work White Stains, which was written in 1898. And the title refers to exactly what your imagination thinks it is. Wow. And it was at one point dubbed the filthiest book ever written <laughs> due to its explicit homoerotic content. Wow. And so he sort of lived his life trying to ba break taboos. Hmm. And he part of that was um, infamous gay sex magic rituals conducted in a Paris hotel in 1914, wow. which really kind of cemented his notoriety, but also highlighted his defiance of societal norms, which mm -hmm. makes him a really significant figure in LGBTQ history. Mm -hmm. And even the house, both skin house, they're tons of documentaries and YouTube videos on that if, yeah. if you want to see, but the house itself is also steeped in lore and supernatural phenomenon. Some people claim that his spirit still lingers there. Others actually believe that malevolent entities that he conjured uh, haunt wow. the manor to wow. this day. And there's a 2007 article in the Scotsman that actually suggests that these entities may have actually been summoned by Crowley himself during his many occult practices. However, there are restoration efforts currently underway to preserve the historic and reportedly haunted site. Mm -hmm. And it is a way of honoring the, you know, complex, but definitely mm -hmm. not controversial. I mean, definitely controversial. Right, right. The of Crowley and the whole kind of mystical intrigue that surrounds him and the house itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, ever, I think everybody, even people who aren't into anything occult know right. the name Aleister Crowley. Yes. And yes. His, you know, so his yeah. reputation and his body of work has really extended far beyond his lifetime and inspired countless people in the realms of both the occult and LGBTQ communities and, you know, definitely people who live in that place where the two cross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's made him, you know, whether you agree with the work he did or not, right. he's definitely an icon in both the paranormal and LGBTQ histories and an important figure to, to mm -hmm. both of those worlds. And also the world of not just paranormal, but just the occult and witchcraft mm -hmm. and all, all of those sorts of things, really. Interesting. So yeah. I didn't realize the book was written that far back. I thought it was yeah. more... 1910 19 but that to write something like that well i mean probably even nowadays but especially back in 1898 how i mean yeah they would have yeah, would have been total film, right yeah very much so especially right. about that subject you know right and then we're talking about someone who was you know a um peer or at least i mean mm -hmm. in the sense that they lived you know around the turn of the century both of them you mm -hmm. know think about oscar wilde he went to prison yeah right for homosexual activity right right yeah um yeah you know and as we'll see as we continue talking those yeah. sorts of things were still happening well into the 20th century even in the mm -hmm. united mm -hmm. states where people were having like legal ramific ramifications for yep. just being gay yep Yep. Um, a couple interesting things. One, I kind of found out, and it was I was going through this, is they used to call Mr. Crowley the crackpot of the empire. Oh, did um, they? Yeah, in England. And it was funny. I re I found that out, and then I realized that I was watching a, um, you know, a, a crime TV show on BBC mm -hmm. or something, a good thing, and they had an episode about him. And mm -hmm. how they call it the crackpot of the empire. And it was really interesting. Um, and the house is actually that bottom picture. The house is actually finished now. Mm -hmm. um, they finished it a couple of years ago. And I know, I, I don't think anybody lives in it. I think it's kind of like a living museum mm -hmm. um, as a caretaker and whatever. But you can um, go back to the house. It's been rebuilt and completed now. So, uh, so our next one, um, 
this is a pretty sad one. I think this is a, probably the saddest one we we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about um, the upstairs lounge. And I have one image of the upstairs lounge. That's the building um, that it, uh, as it is currently, uh, and that building is located at 604 Iberville Street in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, it there are other images. If you choose to find them, you can. They are extremely graphic of the victims of the fire, things like that. And so that's up to you to um, view those if you choose. So on June 24th, 1973, at a gay bar called the Upstairs Lounge, or some people just called it the Upstairs, uh, an arsonist initiated the most deadly attack on LGBTQ plus citizens um, up until the Pulse nightclub shooting on June 11th of 2016. Um, and this was at a local lounge again called the Upstairs Lounge or the Upstairs. Um, and it was on the second floor of this three-story building. So the guests that night, numbering in an estimated of about 110 people um, in this not huge bar, but decent sized bar kind of crammed in everybody was pretty crammed in it actually included members of the local metropolitan community church and if you're not familiar with the metropolitan community church or the mcc church um, it is a pro lgbtq christian church it's still active in the u.s today i've gone to their services a few times 32 people died including the parish pastor reverend bill larson and 15 people were injured as a result of the fire um, or from smoke inhalation. So the official cause is still listed as undetermined origin. The primary suspect is actually um, a gay man with the history of psychiatric impairments named Roger Dale Nunes. And he had been ejected from the bar earlier in the evening, um, but he was never charged uh, in the crime and he actually died uh, by suicide in November of 1974. Um, part of the aftermath of this that was incredibly um, sad is that after the fire, all the local churches except the MCC church refused to hold services for the victims. Um, that included the Catholic church, the Lutheran church, the Baptist church, all of them absolutely refused. And there were two bodies who were never identified. And those bodies weren't identified because they weren't identifiable. Uh, the families just simply refused to to identify them. So they are 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 buried in uh, unmarked marked graves with just a, a date and name. Mm -hmm. uh, so of course today the lounge is believed to be haunted by the spirits of those who perished in that fire. Um, visitors and paranormal investigators report kind of ghostly activity and unsettling occurrences. Um, within the lounge's walls, and that can be, um, they hear sounds of, of yelling, they hear sounds of knocking, they hear sounds of scratching, they hear things, you know, associated with that. Um, and so, you know, exploring this, it kind of offers you a really unique opportunity to not only explore and investigate, but to honor the resilience and memory of those victims while mm -hmm. shedding light right on the intersection of the queer history and the supernatural. And every year they do um, a procession from uh, another one of the local bars kind of uptown, um, clear across the uh, city of New Orleans to this bar. They read out all of the names of the victims, including um, unidentified male number one, unidentified male number two. Um, it's a very significant history of LGBTQ. You don't hear about it a whole lot, I think, because it's just very, um, it was in the 70s. I mean, it's still pretty fresh, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm sure they have families and stuff there, too. And so the building's preserved. It's on the National Historical Site. There's a plaque outside the building about what happened. Um, but I think up until the Pulse um, nightclub shooting, which... Um, we chose not to to cover that um, at this time uh, because that is extremely, extremely recent. Um, yeah. So, uh, and again, we always want to be respectful, but the upstairs lounge you can go into. And and I, I think there might be um, another bar in there on the second 
lore, but I can't I can't quite remember. I'd have to look it up. Oh, again. Okay. But it is being used. Yeah, that's such a sad history. Yeah. Just... Yeah. And something kind of similar to that actually happened in Seattle. Gosh, four no, it had to be like six or seven years ago where somebody started a fire in the exit stairwell um, mm -hmm. of an upstairs bar. I don't know if you remember that. Um, nobody died in it. Nobody was, was killed. There were a couple of injuries, but um, they got the fire out really quickly. But it could have very well been the same, you know, unfortunate outcome there, too. So, wow. Yeah, it makes you stop and think. It is. It's no. all just really heavy to think about and sad. No. You know, even and even for the person who started the fire, mm -hmm. having... Mm -hmm you know, mental health issues and, yeah. And I think yeah. too, just, you know, especially 1974 was really different from mm -hmm. 2004 and just yeah. the, and not to say that there is no pressure on people who are LGBTQ today, mm -hmm. because right. it's, it's not always easy, but right. the world was a lot less. Yeah. Very accepting so. at that mm -hmm. time um mm -hmm. you know which sometimes when you read newspapers and follow yeah. politics and things like that which we try to stay away from mm -hmm. politics here but <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard to believe that the world was less uh, accepting but but we really have have come a long way and yeah um although i will say just to go along with we don't talk about politics i will never ever view talking about human rights and lgbtq rights are absolutely human rights as being mm -hmm. quote unquote political to me that's a right. human rights issue <laughs> so yeah right Ab absolutely yeah yeah you may hear us talking yep. about those yeah. sorts of things i mean not as our main topic because we're a ghost right. podcast but right. these things right. are we're also about people Right. And people and their stories yeah. are important. And, and, you know, one thing I want to bring up too for everybody who's listening to this is, you know, we were very um, open and straightforward about we were celebrate, celebrating Pride. If you saw our Facebook page or our Facebook yeah. community, it was out there. We didn't get one. And this really says something to how much or how cool you guys are and how cool yeah. our listeners are. And it's like, we got one. Um, and it wasn't even mean. It was just kind no, of just misguided. A yeah, a little, little bit of misguided information. We responded. They yeah. were polite about it. Um, but we, we didn't hear anything negative. And so yeah. I really appreciate that. I know Martina really appreciates that, too. Definitely. Um, that's what makes you guys so cool. You know, anyway. Yeah. So. Well, and I think it kind of speaks to the kind of environment you create will kind of attract your people as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because we do include things like like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. We're probably not going to be attracting people who are right. hardcore. Yeah. You know, yeah. against yeah. against things like mm -hmm. human rights. But yeah. you know. Yep. Yep. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit too, and this isn't um necessarily paranormal. No one I wanted Martina and, and me to talk just a little bit about the Stonewall Inn. Yeah. Um, and the Stonewall riots. Um, and because I think that just kind of ties the whole history thing together, right? Because yeah. we like to talk about history too. And, you know, why did things like the upstairs lounge happen? And this is kind of partly where that goes. So, so Martina, you want to start with the Stonewall Inn? Yes. And there is a tiny paranormal possible piece to oh. it, which I will share my opinion on when I get to that part. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but the, Stonewall Inn, that name should be familiar to anyone who is familiar with the gay rights movement, to anyone who is interested in history and, mm -hmm. and wants to be open and affirming and all those things. Yeah. So, in, but it's an interesting history too. Yeah. Um, so, in 1967, four mafiosos <laughs> associated with the Genovese crime family bought the Stonewall Inn which had been previously operating as a restaurant and they reopened it as a gay bar. Really? Yes. And you might be wondering 
why was the mafia interested in gay bars? Why yeah, would more mafia I didn't know that. buy a huh. an inn and open it as a gay bar? So at the time, as it happens, most of the gay bars in New York City were operated by the mafia. And huh. so how that relationship between gay clubs and the mafia started was in the 1960s, homosexual acts were illegal in most states, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not that long ago. Right. No, not at um, all. Right. And it meant because they were legal and also just because of, you know, people being people, <laughs> <laughs> gay people faced a lot of social stigma and discrimination. And so, as a result, establishments known to cater to gay clients often charged exorbitant prices, right? Because if there's money to be made, there's always going to be some mofo there who's willing to <laughs> the price and capitalize on yep. that. Yep. Um, so there were a lot of these places that charged ridiculously high prices mm. or exploited the patrons and staff because they could, because there was yep. nowhere else that people could go out and just yep. live there happy gay lives. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And so it was a weirdly symbiotic, but also exploitative relationship, mm -hmm. but it did allow gay nightlife to exist in some mm -hmm. form, despite the oppressive social and legal climate of the time. And like I said before, if you know anything about the LGBTQ rights movement, you will know that Stonewall is not just any old gay bar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an iconic landmark because it mm -hmm. played a really central role in modern LGBTQ history. What you might also not know, though, is that the Stonewall Inn is a place where visitors have reported according to a little bit of the research I did, seeing apparitions, flickering lights, and unexplained hmm. noises. Interesting. So there are some claims of paranormal activity associated with the historic site. I will tell you they are not widespread, okay. which makes me kind of question them. Mm -hmm, because, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things we talked about in our, in our Facebook group this week was, are you a believer? Are you a skeptic? Mm -hmm. And I firmly, I am a believer, but that doesn't mean I leave my critical thinking at the door. Right, right. <laughs> I definitely believe you can be a believer while still, while still, um, you know, thinking about whether something yeah. is really true or real yeah. or not. So I will yeah. leave it to you whether you are going to believe that the Stonewall Inn <laughs> in is haunted. I will just say that I've seen some reports of things like tables and chairs being moved around after they've been stacked at night for the end of the day, people experiencing strange noises and an eerie presence in the basement in the south of the building and scratching and shuffling sounds. Um, but, you know, is the Stonewall Inn really haunted? We don't know. Yeah. And honestly, it was just a really good segue to talk about <laughs> the Stonewall Inn. Um, yeah, you know, because there there was not a lot of mention of or yeah. detail around any actual haunting there. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to be super corny, it gives us the opportunity to talk about the <laughs> spirit of activism. There you go equality and inclusivity. So this is the part of this episode where we're really going to branch off from our normal paranormal fair because it yeah. is Pride Month and, and it's almost over and talk yeah. about what Stonewall means to the LGBT community and who better to do that than the voice of the... <laughs> <laughs> Get the gay guy to do it. LGBTQ <laughs> plus community, because of course they're a monolith and not all oh, yeah. different people with different opinions right. and stuff like that. Exactly. So James, as their representative, and I hope you all know I'm joking. Just yeah, 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 anyone yeah. who doesn't get sarcasm. <laughs> You probably I shouldn't listen to joking. any of our stuff then. Yeah. I know. Next thing I'm going to be like blacklisted. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Woman. <laughs> That's a big uh, so, take it away, James. <laughs> okay. So a couple things about um, the Stonewall Inn. I have never been there. My husband has been there. Um, it is a 
teeny tiny little bar. And it's basically like almost like a hallway in this building. It's so small. It's not like, because I would think, ooh, big important in our history, big, you know, it's like the the Taj Mahal. Of, no, it's this little teeny tiny bar. You can maybe fit 100 people in it. <laughs> okay, you know what? Just because you're saying Londo, sorry to interrupt, but. Oh, yes. Um, because you say Londo has, uh -huh. has been there. I feel like we should have had him on because. Yeah. Like, y'all. James's husband thinks we are nuts. Oh yeah, complete bonkers. <laughs> he thinks we're crazy already. So yeah. him thinking uh -huh. we're crazy on a podcast yeah. would just entertain me to no end. Yeah. Oh yeah. Someday I'll get him to come on here because he he does. He thinks we're completely insane. Um, completely nuts. <laughs> and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, uh, yeah. But yeah. Not least of which is we kind of are a little. Bit. Oh well, you kind of kind of wants to do this stuff. <laughs> Yeah. We're quirky. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we're we're weird, right? And and that, that's the other part of why we love all of our people because you're all weird yeah, too. You're all weird you? too Whether you know it or not. Yes. Right, right. So moving on from um husbands and what they think of us, of me. Um I wanted to talk just a little bit about the Stonewall riots because that's where that's the whole reason that this month is here, and that's the whole reason we're doing this episode. If that wouldn't have started with the Stonewall riots, who knows what would around today so june 28th 1969 at the stonewall inn in new york's greenwich village um which i do really want to go to because i've just heard greenwich village is a really cool place anyways um the bar like normal was raided by police but instead of responding with the routine compliance that the nypd expected patrons and a growing crowd just really decided to fight back and there were uh, five days of rioting and ensued uh, that ensued and it changed forever the face of gay and lesbian and transgender and bisexual life. So raids on the gay bars were nothing special. Uh, people were really used to it. The average bar would get raided probably once a month. Um, and in this area of Greenwich Village in Harlem, um, there was a sizable gay and lesbian population that actually showed up after World War I. So it was interesting way back in that time. Um, so, and there were kind of the enclaves of the gay men and the lesbians described in a newspaper story as being short-haired women and long-haired men. And that's how you knew back then if somebody was gay or lesbian because of the length of their hair. I just have to laugh at that. Um, so there was this really distinct subculture throughout the following two decades. Now, prohibition inadvertently benefited gay establishments and hence, and by the way, I didn't know the mafia owned most of the gay bars. That was news to me. I didn't, I didn't know that. So yeah, thank me you neither, for finding though. that out. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. So alcohol was pushed underground along with other behaviors that were considered immoral at the time, such as homosexuality. So um, the social repression, uh, uh, excuse me, the social repression of the 1950s kind of resulted in this cultural revolution in Greenwich Village and a cohort of poets and writers and newspeople and we're writing about the evils of the social organization at the time. And some were really brutally honest about what they thought about it. And they were really brutally honest about their thoughts on homosexuality. So the, by the early 1960s, there was a campaign to rid the city of gay bars. Um, it was in full effect by the order of Mayor Robert F. Wagner Jr. Um, and he was concerned about the image of the city uh, in preparation for the 1964 World's Fair. So that's how this whole thing kind of came to fruition. They really started cracking down on the gay bars and gay establishments. Um, entrapment was the name of the game. And entrapment usually consisted um, of an undercover officer who found a man in a bar or a public park and they engaged him in conversation. And if the conversation headed towards the possibility that they might leave together, the officer brought, um, or the officer bought the man a drink, he was arrested for solicitation. So they were very sneaky about it. 
Um, and there was a group, a society called the Madison Society. Um, they succeeded in getting newly elected Mayor John Lindsay to kind of end this campaign of the police entrapment by the New York City police. And they had at the more difficult time with the New York State Liquor Authority kind of getting them to stop cracking down. Um, there were no laws prohibiting serving homosexuals. Courts allowed the state liquor authority um, discretion in approving and revoking liquor licenses for businesses that would um, become uh, disorderly, as they call it. Or in other words, they would serve gay, lesbian patrons. So there was this kind of whole thing through... Um, the years really from probably the 1950s until the actual riots in 1969, 1970s of, you know, police were entrapping people um, that were thought to be gay and lesbian. And eventually people just had enough, right? They'd had enough of being mistreated and um, things like that. So that's really how and why the Stonewall uh, riots happened. So, and Martina, do you want to talk just a little bit about, more about that? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, despite the high population of gay men and lesbians who called Greenwich Village home, there really were not a lot of places other than bars where people could congregate openly without being harassed or arrested, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's so much, that history is so much of why you know, every once in a while, you'll hear people ask things like, what do we need pride for? I don't have straight yeah, pride. Yeah. It's like, no, because you have straight pride every day. You can go out and hold hands with mm -hmm. your with your significant other yep. and, and be affectionate. And nobody's going to do anything to you. You know, there are places today where you can't do that if you're same-sex yeah, partners. Right. You know, yep. we part of how Wandering Spirits got started was James and I went to a few paranormal events last mm -hmm, summer mm -hmm. and, and kind of started talking about, Hey, you're interested in this stuff. I'm interested in this stuff yeah, too. Yeah. Do a podcast. yeah. But one of the events that we went to was in Oregon city mm -hmm. where they were having, which is a really cool old end of the Oregon trail town here in Oregon um, and they were having a pride event and and during the pride festival they were there's a particular business that was doing ghost tours of the mm -hmm. city and we mm -hmm. booked our we booked our tickets for it mm -hmm. and went along on the tour and right this is 2023 I'm talking about yeah and on that tour you know in liberal Western, at least Western Oregon, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we didn't go to all of the places that are normally on the tour because the tour right. guide was concerned right. about there being problems if we went near certain establishments. Um, at one point we did, even though it was a walking tour, this kind of big out of the way mm -hmm. loop to avoid a certain area of town again, because there had been yep. some threats made. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not, you know, at the same time as earlier, I said, we have come a long way, which mm -hmm. we have, and that's beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, this is also not something that's just kind of relegated to history and the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so mm -hmm. this idea of having places that feel really, you know, where you feel safe and yeah. can go out and be with your people and your friends, mm -hmm. right? And by your people, I mean, you know, with people yeah. who are yeah. friendly yeah. to right. you. Right. Um, it's such an important thing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, all of these places, which were the only place where you could con really congregate and kind of be yourself, none of them were owned by gay men or lesbians. Right. right. Um, right. And almost all of them were owned and controlled by organized crime Right. So your choice mm -hmm. is hide away at home and live your life, you know, hidden and in secret or go to these kind of seedy places that, mm -hmm. you know, are not the best environment, but were pretty much the only places you could go. And 
despite that, because they were the only places, the regulars were often treated poorly. Liquor was watered yeah. down. They were overcharged for drinks, right? Because if you, yeah. if if it's a supply driven market, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can mm -hmm. do that stuff. Yeah. Um. And the mafia had the ability to pay off police to prevent raids from happening quite as frequently as they might have had it just been, you know, some regular guy owning owning mm -hmm. a bar. Because at that time, police raids on gay bars were really frequent, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes occur occurring once a month mm -hmm. for each bar, which is, which is quite a bit when you're trying to run a business and don't want your patrons right, right. to exactly. run off. And... Because of the ability to bribe people, the bar management usually knew about the raids beforehand mm -hmm. due to police tip-offs and those sorts of things. And raids tended to occur early enough in the evening that businesses could business could still commence after the police had finished. So it was a really different environment from, mm -hmm. you know. Obviously, there were, were gay police officers back then, too. And I'm sure they helped tip off, you know the the bars that, that maybe they went to and and things like that so um one other um ghost story to do with lgbt that i just remembered about but this is um i wanted to bring up so that our listeners can do their research on their own if they'd like um i cannot remember the gentleman's name in england that developed the uh, machine to fight the world war ii enigma machine um and he I cannot remember. Alan Turing. Oh, okay. Alan, Alan Turing was a gay man. Um, oh. he, yeah, he was a great, there's a great movie um, about him. And, but the um, place where all of the, all of his work took place and he created this massive computer to fight the Nazi Enigma machine, which was on submarines and ships. Um, it was a coding machine. He, he was gay. And the, um, at the end of the war, he literally saved the British Empire from the Nazis, his machine. They found out he was gay, and he actually went through um, the process of chemical castration uh, because he was gay. And not until 2022 did the Queen and Parliament actually pardon him and award him medals. And so that's another story. But it's said that the place where that computer was created is very haunted with Alan's it was his life. It was his whole life was trying to figure this code out. He was a, a brilliant mathematician, just a brilliant mathematician. And in fact, he, sorry, I'm squirreling off the topic here. Um, he kind of was thinking about artificial intelligence and AI before anybody else ever was just a brilliant man. Anyway, sorry, I kind of squirreled off, but that's another story you can go in Interesting. and look into. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so ironic that he would have to be pardoned by, right. by the queen thinking just about some of the things. Yeah. The yeah. king's brother, the current king's brother has been involved yeah. in the thing. Right, He's right. Be pardoning someone. Exactly. Someone else, but that's way off topic. But yeah, but no, 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 you're right. Yeah, it that's totally how my brain yeah. works. <laughs> yep. No, it's squirrel. We we do a lot of squirreling in this pot. Well, you yes. guys know that. You've listened to us enough. Um, we, <laughs> we kind of squirrel off a bit. So in closing, I hope that everybody enjoyed this episode. Um, I hope that, look, the main thing I want everybody to remember is, is we're all individuals. We're all humans. We all deserve to be loved and respected. You don't have to agree with me. But but you have I, to agree with no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta agree with Martina, man. Um, no, you, but but you gotta respect, right? Just treat other people the way you want to be treated. It's very simple, anyway. Yes. Um. So we have some really cool stuff coming up. Um, we are gonna do our unraveling of the mysteries of paranormal entities part two. Um, you guys asked for a part two of that, do a little series on that. That's going to come out on July 12th. The Pisgah Colony House uh, that we went to um, with DBK Investigations, we're going to record that episode. That was a really cool investigation. That's going to come out on July 26th. So we're very excited about that. Yeah. And That'll I also just realized that through this entire episode, I called it Greenwich Village, didn't I? 
You did, but I didn't say anything because I feel like it's my revenge on people who insist on calling Oregon, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> to the people of Greenwich Village, I do apologize. I do that a lot. I do it a lot. If, if you watch our video about um, getting up to Pisgah calling, I made Martina say it first because I was going to call it Pisaga or Hoogabugga or some, <laughs> you know, just random thing. I, so, again, my apologies to those of Greenwich Village. That could Google just be your thing, though, in our episodes that you like really yeah. jack up the names of things. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like there's uh, um, the food they make usually looks really awful, but there's this, <laughs> there are these, this couple who does like live stream cooking videos and they always have. I, keep wanting to cuss and I'm and having to stop myself. They <laughs> always have weird stuff in their uh -huh. refrigerator and that's kind of their thing in their videos. <laughs> to be really messing up names of places. I think you should consider. <laughs> oh God, that's funny. Uh, well, anyways, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you again, everybody uh, for listening. And uh, yeah. as always, you can find us on Facebook and on YouTube and Spotify, Apple, wherever podcasts are done. We're there. You can find us. Absolutely. And thank you for indulging us in an episode yes. that was a little different from our normal stuff, but yep. Yep. that we felt was important. So as always, everyone, thank you for joining us for this episode. Uh, please hit that like and subscribe button. Share us with your friends and your family and whoever. It helps us out and it helps the channel out. And we really appreciate you. And we, we will chat with you soon. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.